Good morning. Um, are you able to see my slides? So cancer is becoming increasingly more and more common. Unfortunately, in the course of their lifetime, one in two people will be diagnosed with, with cancer. And some of these cancers are very highly likely to spread to the bone, including lung, breast, and prostate cancer. When these cancers spread to the bone, it's known as metastatic bone disease or MBD. And unfortunately, this condition also causes the, the destruction and weakness to bone, necessitating uh, patients to have orthopedic surgery oftentimes. Now, there are two different ways that patients may be treated with orthopedic surgery for impending fracture or for pathologic fracture. Now, in these pictures here, we have images uh, an x-ray and an MRI from a patient who came in experiencing excruciating bone pain and didn't know why. And the scans revealed that she had these malignant lesions here in her bones. She, because of the extent of these lesions, she was told not to wait there uh, because of the high risk for fracture. And she was hoping to have surgical treatment to repair this preventatively. Unfortunately, however, within about two weeks, she ended up having what's called a pathologic fracture in which case the, uh, this weakness here did end up breaking, which is really uh, evident, especially in this picture right here. So she received then the orthopedic surgery treatment. Now, why is this important in the context of clotting? Well, MBD patients are also very high risk for developing clotting. For increased thrombosis, there are key, three key factors and malignancy, just having it inherently increases and induces a hypercoagulable state in patients through the release of procoagulant um, inflammatory proteins like cytokines. Also venous stasis occurs in this population because of these lesions, these cancerous lesions that spread to bone, oftentimes they target areas like the spine, the pelvis, uh, the long bones. And this can make it very difficult for patients to ambulate and weight bear. And that lack of mobility decreases muscle movement, which also causes a decreased blood flow and stagnation of blood. Now, thirdly, because MBD patients often require that orthopedic surgery, the, the trauma that surgery induces uh, causes trauma to the blood vessels, and that, that cutting of the blood vessels exposes clotting factors within the blood vessel walls that also increase the risk of developing blood clots. And this actually puts these patients at a seven times higher risk for developing venous thromboembolism or VTE uh, than patients who don't have cancer who are receiving the same orthopedic surgery. And venous thromboembolism encompasses two conditions. We have deep vein thrombosis or DVT and pulmonary embolism, PE. And here we can see in this uh, Doppler ultrasound, the, the blood clot here, oftentimes they do arise in the legs. And if they travel in circulation through the body, they can cause blockages in the arteries of the lungs. And here we can see three emboli here in, in this patient's uh, lung. Now, in the context of orthopedic surgery, this, is, this can be a very difficult problem to try to manage because we know that patients are at very high risk of developing blood clots after surgery, but the current guidelines that, that orthopedic surgeons are using to prescribe medications to prevent blood clots, the thromboprophylaxis guidelines, were actually developed on patients who had orthopedic surgery but who did not have cancer. So this means that unfortunately these cancer-associated risk factors are not being taken into consideration uh, when applied to this population. So we were really interested in learning under these current prescription guidelines, how are patients responding? What, what is happening to coagulation over time in this patient group in the healing period after surgery? So in our study, we wanted to look at both the extent and duration of hypercoagulability in this patient group, patients who had MBD who received, who had orthopedic surgery, and everyone was receiving standardized uh, blood thinning medication after surgery. And because patients had mal malignancy, we hypothesize that they would be hypercoagulable for a longer time frame, potentially even greater than four weeks, which is that window of time when patients are receiving blood thinning medication after surgery. So we wanted to use a methodology uh, called thrombolastography or TAG, and this is very novel in this group. Um, TAG testing is not new itself, but it is new in terms of this patient group with metastatic bone disease and doing so over time. So just a little bit more about thrombolastography. So this is our thrombolastography machine here, and this is our cartridge. It's a simple point of care blood test in which case we take a small one milliliter sample of blood, we put it into the cartridge, 
the cartridge is then inserted into the machine and we receive an output. Uh, the machine induces uh, vibrations on the, the sample and the vibration causes movement of the sample and this amplitude of movement is actually put into a tracing by the machine. And this tracing, here we can see the shape of this tracing, it can indicate coagulable state in patients. So we have our amplitude of frequency here, we have time which is representative of the clotting process. Here we are especially interested at this parameter maximum amplitude or MA, which indicates clot strength. Now we're able to see hypercoagulability, this tracing looks different. We can see that this maximum amplitude has increased and a stronger clot is being formed. And previous research by our group has indicated that when this MA value is 65 millimeters or greater, this has been predictive of VTE events in orthopedic surgery patients who did not have cancer. So for our study design, we followed patients uh, at seven different time points. First one preoperatively right before surgery. We also followed them during their hospital stay every other day starting the day after surgery on day one, three, and five. And then after the patient was discharged, we wanted to see, to continue to monitor them at their two weeks, six weeks, and three months follow-ups visits with their surgeon, we also followed them and collected blood samples as well. We did also pair an ultrasound, a Doppler ultrasound of both legs on day three while the patient was in hospital so that we could correlate potentially the incidence of DVT with our tag value from that day's test. So the patients who we included were adult patients who had MBD. We also included hematological malignancies of the bone, and we did have two patients with multiple myeloma. Patients had to be undergoing orthopedic surgery, and impending or actual pathologic fracture repair was okay for the study. Now, we excluded anybody who had a primary bone tumor, anyone who was pregnant or intending to become pregnant during the study period, and anyone who was actually receiving treatment of uh, DVT or PE would be excluded. So uh, if patients were taking baby aspirin or if they were taking um, some medication to treat a cardiac condition, they were still included. It was just as long as it was not a therapeutic level of anticoagulant for uh, clot prevention or treatment. We were able to enroll 21 people over the course of our study. Uh, roughly evenly split between males and females, 11 males and 10 females. Our average age is 70 years, and we have nine different cancers that we were able to capture in our study. The, the highest, the most frequent ones were breast cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal, which is also really what we would expect in the general population as well. So a nice representative cohort here. When we took those maximum amplitude values and we plotted them over our study timeline, we have here our 65 millimeter predictive threshold and we have our shaded window here where people are within that window of risk of developing those DVT and PE complications. Here in our red line, we see our patients who did have a VTE event and we have here our green line showing patients who did not have a VTE event throughout our three month study period. And we can see that regardless of whether patients had an event or not, they are within that window of increased risk for developing blood clots. Now, when we look individually at uh, the patients who did have events, we still have our green line here representative of people who did not have VTE. We have our five patients here spread out who did have VTE represented in these colored lines. And the star here that I've included, this pink star shows where that four out of these five events occurred within the first week after surgery. And just to, to point out these, uh, these endpoints here, are just where the patient had an event. Uh, so nothing to, to be worried about. It was just, we didn't follow the patients afterward because of the, the change in treatment afterward. They no longer met inclusion criteria because they were now receiving that therapeutic dosage of anticoagulant. So next, we were really interested in looking at that four week window where patients are receiving that prescription. So patients receive 4,500 units of uh, low molecular weight heparin called tinzaparin daily for the course of 28 days. For, so for this four week window we have right here, we have our patients who experienced VTE and our patients who did not experience VTE. Now we can see that patients are still hypercoagulable even beyond this period after they've stopped this medication. So even six weeks post-op, when we, we did a follow-up visit with these patients, they were at about 66 millimeters, which is above that, that, that threshold of 65 for VTE risk. 
Now, when we're looking at three months post-op, we are still seeing that at 64, patients have still not returned to their preoperative values. So they're still hypercoagulable in relation to their pre-op state. So why is this clinically significant? This is really important because right now we're prescribing patients medication on a four week time frame, but our TAG data shows that patients are hypercoagulable even six weeks later and beyond. And we're seeing that patients are at especially high risk for VTE within that first week postoperatively as well. So this brings up maybe some other questions and other future directions for us where we can potentially look at what are these mechanisms for coagulation in patients with metastatic bone disease? And what are maybe some alternatives for prescription? Are there other pathways that potentially could be targeted in treatment options that may be effective in this population as well to reduce that, that risk of developing DVT and PE? And I wanted to say thank you to, to the study team at, uh, at the Foothills Medical Center in Calgary, my supervisor, all the surgeons who participate in our research, and of course, the patients and the staff who help make all of this possible. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. I, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'm wondering if you're aware that the clot amplitude, or the tag amplitude is not only due to clot strength, but also due to the clot amount. I'm wondering if you have measured the fibrinogen amount in all your samples. Um, we did not measure fibrinogen amount in all of the samples. However, uh, we are looking into testing using platelets, uh, platelet mapping, which also is a different cartridge available for, for the TAG machine, which does look into fibrinogen and it looks into agonist ADP and AA as well for the clotting process. So uh, that could be a potential future direction for us, but it's currently not something that we're actively testing for at each time point along with our tag testing. Were there metastases, liver involved in any of those patients? Uh, we actually... For liver metastases, yes, there were a few patients who had liver metastases. So we did include other comorbidities and other, other potential factors that could increase clotting risk in this population. And uh, other areas of visceral metastasis was recorded. I don't have that specific information on the numbers, but, but I do recall that there were a few who did have spread to the liver as well. That's very interesting because especially there, you may expect fibrinogen levels to be affected. Fascinated by the TEG, uh, interesting. Did you venogram all the patients to get an objective uh, correlation with your TEG? In other words, how did you correlate your TEG results with thrombosis? Uh, we correlated our results with the diagnosed, uh, with the confirmed VTE event. So we used Doppler ultrasound at that day three post-op time point to correlate whether or not that DVT was found with what our value uh, by tag was for that day. So that's how we did our correlation. Now uh, at the study follow-ups, throughout the, the three month period that we followed these patients, we did always ask patients if they had any incidents of DVT or PE. And again, this was recorded if it had been symptomatic and the patient had gone to the hospital and received a Doppler ultrasound or a CTPE scan, which did confirm the incidence of, of the event. So, so that's how we recorded it. Uh, by testing, by aligning our day three post-op data, tag data with an ultrasound and pairing that together, that was the best way that we would be able to uh, do that correlation. Once patients were out of the hospital, it was, it's very difficult to try to get them back to do an ultrasound on the same day as a tag test, although that would be fantastic. So we, we opted that the most feasible option would be for us to be recording those events uh, when reported by patients. And we always made sure to ask them. And we, we wanted not not we wanted to make sure that they were symptomatic and had been confirmed with those diagnostic tests to be included. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you very, very much, much Lisa. Lisa. That was a very interesting presentation and we wish you the best of luck finishing the project.